Well, looky here, we seem to have a best of. We're going back to episode 110. Love this episode. My firefighting buddy from New York, Danny Sheridan, and these incredible angels that help these incredible firefighters save lives. I believe that there's a lot of divine intervention. Yeah, there's no way we could do this job without help. It's too crazy. It's too dangerous. It's, it's like insanely dangerous. This is Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. Those moments when heaven and earth collide and we see God, we see His hand reaching out to us, attempting to get our attention, inviting us into a closer relationship. Here we share stories of encounter with angels, divine intervention, prophetic dreams, visions, near-death experiences, big and little God incidents. I'm your host, Trapper Jack. Welcome. We would be at episode 110. What's it called? The Angels That Rescue Firefighters. The Angels That Rescue Firefighters, because they do. And you're going to hear a lot of stories in this episode from Danny Sheridan, a 30-plus year veteran of firefighting in New York City. This guy's got stories. This guy's got stories. I'm still getting emails from Danny saying, oh, I forgot a story. Hey, you want to talk again? I got another story. So I think there's a good chance there'll be a part two to this story as well. And of course, it's all biblical. This, this is, as, as I always say, everything that was going on 2,000 years ago and before, still going on now. Jesus still sending his angels, still with divine intervention. Nothing has stopped. Angels are not living off the 401ks in Florida in the villages. They're just not. They are doing good work. Fellow servants. We are all fellow servants. So here are some great examples of how those good angels help these good firefighters do God's good work. Danny thinks he might have been searching within his podcast app for a podcast about angels, and we popped up. And now he listens, and uh, usually at night... As he's, you know, going to bed, as, as many of you do. You know, as I, I use it for at night, just like when I'm ready to go to bed, I just turn it on and set the timer and usually pass out after about 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm famous for putting people to sleep. <laughs> it's not that. It's just... Um, Danny, just... you're getting very sleepy right now. You're getting very <laughs> sleepy. Yep. Yeah, that doesn't take much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you assume you have an angel near you. Yeah, I, I, yeah, he's around. Oh, he's he, around. She, whatever. He, yeah. she, something. Well, I think it might be a she because one time, I, this was amazing. I, I, I mean, I, I get chills when I think about it. I was like, um, I, I did something very stupid. We were in the, we were bouncing around the village and probably we were just getting a little too crazy, you know. And uh, I don't know how I wound up doing this, but I started a fight with a gang. A gang, like 15 kids from another part of the city. Against you? Me and my friend. Was alcohol involved? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just checking. <laughs> of course. Of course. So, alcohol may, may have been involved. May have, may have had a slight part in this. Uh, so let's take on know. 15 guys. Good idea. Okay. So, yeah. So I decided to take on the world. Me and my, and I dragged my poor friend into, all of a sudden we're in a fray and I'm like, this is not going well. And I'm telling you, I, I still can't believe this happened. This black woman, she had to be about six foot five. I, she was enormous. She, <laughs> she shows up, and between two parked cars, a, a taxi cab pulls up, and the door opens. She grabs me and my friend and throws us into the taxi cab, and the taxi cab takes off. And I was like, what, what, what was that? <laughs> like, like, what the heck? Was going, what was that all about, you know? Yeah. Uh, we just had an episode where there was a large black woman who was an angel. You hear that one? I heard. Yeah, I heard that yeah. One. yeah. So That's what I thought of it. I was like, oh, man, that happened to me. <laughs> Might be the same one. It could, it could be the same angel. Could have been the but same she angel. picked us up. Yeah. And my friend's a big guy, too, you know, like, and she just picked us up. She put her <laughs> body in between us and the, the ruckus, you know, the crowd. And flung us into the cab. Like, there was a cab on this random side street in the Greenwich Village, like, you know? And, um, and she just slammed the door and the cab took off and that was it. This actually begins uh, for Danny. Well, you know, you could, you could actually say at age three, he got a little taste of this divine help, angelic help, perhaps. 
growing up in New York City. He's three years old. He has a younger sister. It's Halloween, so it's 1964, Halloween. Mom and Dad are going to go out to a party that night. Uh, who's going to watch the kids? And looks like, I guess, my mom and my grandmother were fighting. So my grandmother grabs my mother and says, listen, um, those kids are staying with me tonight, you know? My mother's like, no, I, I already got it sorted, man. It's already, you know, Diane's coming. And they went back and forth. And finally, my, my mother, I guess, caved in, and she says, okay, you know, we lived on the fifth floor. My grandmother lived on the third floor. So everyone was going to my friend's house for this party. My father came home from this party. I guess he probably was overserved, I would imagine. And uh, next thing you know, the fire, there's a fire in our apartment. He's trapped in the kitchen. Uh, everyone's screaming, you know, like trying to bang on the door. You know, the apartment's fully involved. And then he goes out the window with the ladder, and uh, everyone thought we were in there. And meanwhile, we were down with my grandmother. And I remember the next morning going up to the apartment and like the whole thing was burnt out. And I remembered 20 years later when I got on the fight apartment, and I remember that smell and the, the whole the whole scene, you know. So, you know, had we been in there, I'm sure uh, he would have let the babysitter go home and we probably would have been stuck in there, you know. Divine intervention. Perhaps an angel's help, huh? So you're a firefighter or what are you? A battalion chief in New York City. Oh, you're a big guy in this thing. You've been doing this for a while. A long time, yeah, 34 years. Oh, that's good for you. Good for you. Are you chewing gum? Did you bring enough for the rest of the class? <laughs> no, I'm not chewing gum. I just had a piece of candy in my mouth. <laughs> See, I catch, I catch you on everything, pal. Wow, you're very sensitive now. Hold on. I just didn't want anybody, you know, if there's always going to be a listener saying, hey, he didn't bring enough for the rest of the class. What's going on? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. Uh, well, very good. Okay, so you're writing a book or something. What are you, what are you up to? My first book is called Parables from the Fireground. And it's just straight straight up stories from you know the fire fire ground. But by default, I would say um, a third of them probably have some sort of intervention in there without even being specific about it. I mean, if you read through the lines, you'll realize that like some incredible things happen. You know, like Father Mike Judge was our chaplain, and I mean, he was a real dear friend of mine. Uh, when did he pass um, away, or what happened there? Nine eleven. Oh, really? You, did you lose many guys that you knew? Oh, did I lose? Yeah, I lost about 80, 80 friends, I would say. 80. 80 people that I work with, yeah. 80? 80, 80, oh, yeah. Wow, devastating. Yeah. And you could write a whole book on all the 9-11 stories. I could tell you right now, two separate battalions were both held up at a... Um, I don't know, like a bridge or a tunnel, and they were waiting for one company, and that delay saved their lives. Because the building was coming down soon, that kind of yep, thing? Yep, yep, Had they been, you know, had they gone when they were intending to go, they, they probably would have got there earlier, and they probably would have been involved in a collapse. And I, I know two battalions that were involved in it, so. Wow. And yeah. you know, you, you, and I remember at the time too, how many stories did we hear like that? There were, I, I want to say only, you know, 3000 people or whatever it was in the building. Mm. I mean, those buildings could have been packed. Those, I, it, we, there are so many stories of this guy was running late. This guy was supposed to be at a meeting. This guy was supposed to, you know, all these things, right. you know, so. Yeah. And yep. still you, you know, but you lost 80. That's, that's devastating. I would say 80 guys, 80 guys that I knew that I either worked with or friends with or. Yeah probably 20 close people and you know just 80 to 90 that i i just knew from working with you know were you on that call did you go no my company went and the lieutenant we lost our lieutenant and mm. i uh i was supposed to work that night so oh so you I were you were home or what yeah, it was my wife's birthday on the 10th and i stayed you know we were home but i wasn't scheduled to work my my, my groups were in the next day so yeah. uh you, you uh, did you grow up with faith yeah, I was an altar boy. I went to Catholic school for like 16 years. Yeah. Well, a lot of us went to Catholic school, but it didn't really stick. <laughs> um, did it stick with you or did you wander away for a while, come back? What was your story? No, I would say I, I've probably been a soldier my whole 59 years on this planet. So as a, as a firefighter, you're talking about you're writing the book and there's a book within a book here and maybe another book about divine interventions, like we were I mentioning so. earlier. Yeah. Talk about some of those. Have you had some of your own? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I put, I put three of them in the book. There was one fire we had. Um, I mean, just like minor stuff. It was, a, it was a, like a vacant um, factory down in the 
you know, the south end of the Bronx. And, uh, you know, we responded. I was in a truck company and, you know, we were forcing, you know, it was all cinder blocked up, you know. And then so me and my partner, we were banging away in the blocks. And anyway, we finally got them open and the fire is like raging inside. And uh, I see this drop off the uh, roof, you know, um, like through the roof. Um, and I realized it was, it was a fireman. And you're this, seeing a fireman fall where, from where to what? Through the roof uh, in the factory. Oh my. He went right through the roof and into this raging fire. Right. And, uh, it was full of like, like machinery metal. It was all sorts of crazy, like machines and sharp metal poles and whatnot. And there was a bed in the middle of all this, you know, like this whole not, chaos. It was a bed. Like there was homeless people living in there. So he falls right onto the bed. And then, um, you know, we go in to grab him. And, you know, he's all disheveled. And uh, he, the only thing he burnt was his nose. And, uh, you know, we, we took him out. He was fine. Like he, if he had landed two feet over, he, he would have been impaled on, on anything. That's crazy. You know? Yeah. How, how, how far did he fall? 20 feet, 30 feet maybe, yeah. Onto a bed? Mm-hmm. Gee. Yeah. Um, More angels. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe it. And then um, there was another fire. Um, I wasn't supposed to work. Um, I, I just, I had to do some work in my house, and I just did not want to be... You know, I didn't want to be there. I, at work, I had to finish this job. So I, um, I don't know, I planned on doing this job. And my buddy was like, he needed me to work for him. And I was like, you know what? I can't work. I'm, I, I can't. I'm sorry. I just, I want to get this. He says, please, you know, he's begging me. I got to get this stuff done at home. And, you know, it's, um, so finally I gave in. I'm like, you know what? All right. Um, you know, I'll, uh. I'll work. This story actually was in a book. Uh, Joan Weston Anderson was her name. Uh, Where Miracles Happen, I think, is the name of the book. Okay. It was about 25, 30 years ago. So, anyways, I decided to, I, I worked, and um, I get to the firehouse, and, you know, it's around noon, um, and, you know, the bells go off, and we get a, a call for this building fire, and, um, you know, we saddle up, we get on the rig, and for some reason, I don't know what possessed me to do this, but I pulled up my boots, I buckled up my coat, I I, every, I had the tools on my sitting on my uh, my lap, and I was, uh, the position that I had was called the irons, right? So the irons is the guy that does the force point tree and whatnot. So I was sitting on the opposite side of my officer and the other firefighter that carries the extinguisher, you know? So we pull around the corner, and the fire is out every single window on the third, third or fourth, third floor. You know, so I knew the building because we had been there just the previous set of tours. We had a, a fire in the same, same exact building, same exact you know mo. So I don't know. They were trying to burn the building down, or whatever. So um, we make the we make the turn, and um, the chauffeur pulls up. And I'm on the side closest to the building, so I just, without thinking, I wasn't even thinking. I just jumped off the rig, and, uh, you know, I started going into the building. And the rest of my team, I guess they wound up, they, the chief told them to do something, check something else or whatever, and I got separated from them. So, you know, I go into the building, and the fire's on the third floor, and it's now, you know, it's like right at the door, you know. So um, I see the engine. And I tell the officer, I said, listen, man, I'm, you know, I'm going above. And they're like, good, we got you. You're going above. So I go above and, you know. How do you I, go uh, above? What does that mean? I, I mean, I went up the staircase above the fire. Okay. Which is like the, like the danger, dangerous place in that kind of fire, you know. But you're on the outside of the building doing this? Inside. No, inside. You are inside. Okay. Inside, yeah. So, um, yeah, I got to the door and, you know, it's like lights out and I was just, searching around and I just heard this little whimper like a like just nothing like I can't even believe I heard it and I I go into the bedroom and I find a crib and I thought it was a doll you know I just I reached in and I don't know why I 
I thought it was, I really thought it was just a doll. It was so small, you know. I scooped I scooped up the doll, and uh, then I think I realized it was a baby at some point. I'm not sure because it was just it was like crazy. Like you know, it was just couldn't see like the hand in front of your face, and it was just it was just nuts, you know. So I I didn't have a radio, you know. I'm separated. I thought my guys were with me, and they weren't with me. So I just bolted out the apartment, and I I had to go back down the stairs, like going into the the chimney, you know, down the, down the chimney. And, um, I got to the street and everyone was busy. I saw like a police car and I handed off the baby and they raced off to the hospital and the baby, the baby lived. He was, he was in a hospital for two weeks, intensive care, you know, but the thing the the way I thought it was kind of strange was that I wasn't supposed to work. And if the person that was going to work probably would have followed the other guys. You know, yeah, you, I, I know, you left I know. everybody. You left. Yeah, but I didn't do it on purpose. It was just kind <laughs> no, of, it's just know, whatever yeah. the nudge, whatever. Wow. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, it was just something when as soon as I got on the rig, it was just something was a gut feeling that I had to like. I don't know what it was. It's just I knew I, I knew I had to be there. You know, I knew I had to be on that um, on that floor above. And you know, my team, we got separated. They wound up doing another job and. No, I know that if I had uh, not worked and the guy that was going to work worked, uh, it, it probably would have turned out a little differently. Yeah, you've got that was a smoke filled room, no lights, nothing. Nothing, yeah. yeah sure. Wow. How, how, gee, when you got down there, what, how old did the baby look? Are we talking like months, just little months? 10 days old. 10 days? Yeah. Where was mom and dad? So they, <laughs> they had a babysitter. Their other kid got bit by a rat. So they were at the hospital and left this baby with this kid. And the kid, I guess, bolted out of the apartment. And, you know, the kid was by himself. <laughs> what? Yeah, they left the kid by himself, 10 days old. So, Yeah, we'll be right back. Yeah. And then a fire breaks out. Oh, my gosh. That would have been devastating for him. Was it a babysitter or what did you say, older brother? What was it? I don't know who, who they left because I never really, they couldn't speak English, you know. So okay. I just, we did like uh, I did my little broken Spanish at the time, yeah. And I got that, you know. She was oh, I was in the hospital, and you know my other kid just got bit by a rat, and you know we had to take him to the hospital, and they left the baby with like a twelve year old, and I guess the kid panicked, left the baby home. Oh, so. that would have been. Can you imagine carrying that around for the rest of your life? You know, if that did not turn, if yeah. you hadn't done what you had done, and wow, yeah, wow. You're just lucky when I'm, I'm You know, you really wonder, you know, how angels do all this stuff, because you know they're involved in so much of this. No, you know it. They're all over I the know. highways. I mean, there should be so many more accidents than there are and fatalities than there are and accidents. You know, I just... Yeah. Or, or for a firefighter, I can't imagine how busy they are. As you do good work, they're going to be there helping you do good work. See, I believe that. I believe that that we, we're, we're the hands, but um, I think there's a lot of divine intervention. There's no way we could do this job without help. It's mm. too crazy. It's too dangerous. It's it's like insanely dangerous, you know. Yeah. The the biggest uh, uh, I I conv I'm convinced to this day that this guy is an angel. I put this in my book, um, and I if you read between the lines, you have to you have to realize there's some divine intervention in this story. Yeah. So, well, you don't have to read between the lines when you tell us. You can, you can just yeah, tell us yeah. as it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, I can't be that, we all can't be this good. I mean, God has to have his hand in it because there's no way that we could do these things. You know, I wasn't scheduled to work Christmas Eve. I was actually scheduled to be off, but um, some of the senior guys took off, so they needed to hire somebody for overtime. So I didn't have any kids at the time, um, so I, I decided to, um, you know, I stepped up to work Christmas Eve, but they were sending us what we call a detail. Right, detail comes from another firehouse and fills in an open spot. So the detail comes, and um, you know, there's a black guy, and his, you know, his uniform looked like he stopped at the the store and bought it, and then showed up at the firehouse with this brand new spanking helmet and coat. It was like right out of the box. <laughs> And you guys are you guys kind of like your stuff all dinged up, right? You, you got some wear on it. At, yeah. at the time we did, yeah. So anyway, so he was assigned my position, which was the um, you know on the inside team in the truck company. 
and I'm stuck here with the chief, and he wanted to go. We do mass. Uh, it was a tradition. We did mass at one of the firehouses. So, you know, we were going to go over, visit his firehouse, then go to this kind of midnight mass, you know, at the firehouse, and then, you know, have our big turkey dinner or whatever. So we go up, and then uh, on the way back, we turn the corner, and down the block, I see this woman. She's doing jumping jacks. Like, she's just... That's what they do. Like they, they just get frantic. She's jumping up and down, and and as I get closer, you know, she's pointing, right? She's pointing, and then we get closer now, and uh, I look to the left, and a fire is in this five-story tenement, and it's on the first floor. It's blowing out into the middle of the street. There's so much fire, right? <laughs> the second engine comes up there on the floor above, and we got fire like on both sides in both apartments. I noticed. I just happened to notice that this guy. He's standing in the street, you know, with his tools, and he he wasn't in the building. Yeah, he he was outside, um, lost. He had that look like the deer in the headlights kind of look, you know. Like where am I supposed to be on this one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bottom line, you got a you got a fireman standing out there in the road, kind of wondering where he's supposed to be. So he's really he, like he's still holding the can. Like there's there's enough fire, like like a, you know, the building is f- like almost fully involved. And he's he's got a little extinguisher just on his hand and his hook, you know. So anyway, we all go to the back of the store. There's about seven of us in the back of the store, right? And um, all of a sudden, we hear this commotion at the front of the store, you know, and it's this guy, and he's screaming. He's like, we got fire. <laughs> he's like yelling, we got fire, fire, you know. And, like, finally, the lieutenant just, like, looked at the nozzle guy and he says, he says hey, Jimmy, let's just see what this is all about. So we all went to the front of the store, seven of us. And we get there and it's like, there's like these little embers burning in the doorway. The, at, just at that moment where we vacated the back of the store, the whole rear of the building collapsed, five stories. And the guy that was on the second floor, this guy had the nozzle, was hanging upside down in the, um, in the cables. And, um, you know, we were standing right there, not, not two minutes before. And, you know, um, it was all because of him screaming. Now, I always think if I was working, there would have been no one screaming. I would have been inside pulling ceilings or whatever, you know. So we all probably would have been right under that that collapse. You should have all died. As, and that yeah. guy who was hanging from the cable, how the heck did he live? What what happened there? I don't know how. I, <laughs> it's what amazing. Thing? I don't know how he survived, man. What, what cables was he hanging from? BX cables. Just what does that mean? Cables. Uh, you know, like wiring. Romex, just, you know, like... The wiring, wiring. of the building. Yeah. The wiring yeah. of the... So this five-story thing comes tumbling down, and he gets yep. caught up in the wiring, and it saves yep. his life. Hanging upside down. Oh, man. Yep. At the front of the store was nowhere close to as bad as the back of the store, right? No. I think that when we got back to the firehouse, I don't remember this guy being there. Like, he kind of disappeared. Let's pause... Right about here. Then more with Danny Sheridan and those firefighting angels here on Touched by Heaven. Quick Patreon shout out. Dean McVicker. Well, he's sprouting his own angel wings. He is. He's, he, he, and they, they look darling. Just real. And join the Patreon family. Thank you, Dean McVicker, for, um, for being a part of the Patreon family to make this all go. We have, as I say, two fuels here. We need your stories. So thank you, Danny, for that. And thank you, Dean McVicker. Providing the petrol, if you will, to keep this all going along, you can come here at episode 261 at touchbyheaven.net or going to patreon.com and just search for Tramper Jack. Thanks so much. Let's get back to Danny. More firefighting angels here on Touched by Heaven. Everyday encounters with God. We had a collapse a week, bef- a month before that. We had a, a same type of thing. Um, you know, it was the second fire of the night in this building and... <sighs> I was um, I was up on the top floor, and the engine is in front of me, and uh, <clears throat> my friend Billy again, he, you know, he says, "Hey, this don't feel right," and he grabs me, pulls me back, and then at the same time, the whole building fell down. The whole building collapsed into the back, and the nozzle went. He went down into the basement, and then um, we wound up digging him out, and he he lived. He, he survived. So. The stuff you've seen, my gosh. <laughs> the, the the captain of that firehouse, he became chief. And, uh, we, you know, he's at a vacant building. And uh, there was probably, 
I want to say three engine companies, three hose lines, and three truck companies, and I, I want to say 30 guys in the building, you know, and we have this, it's called SIDS. It, it's just like um, information about the building that's like on the on the response ticket. He calls this driver. He says, hey, Mike, whatever, you know, what is there any SIDS on this building? And he says, I don't know, chief. He says, you have an address? He says, hold on. He says, he gave him the address. He says, yeah, it's uh, whatever, 500 Main Street, whatever it was, you know. And then he says, hold on, chief. And he calls the dispatch. He says, hey, is there any SIDS for, you know, 500 Main Street? And then 30 seconds later, he says, yeah, under no circumstances should anybody be in that building, right? So they're into this building now, 10, 15 minutes, and the chief gets on the radio. Everybody out of the building immediately. Now, everybody vacates the building, 30 guys. No no sooner did the last guy leave, the building collapsed. <laughs> so. this, just, this happens over and over again, doesn't it? This is it just, used to happen. Not, not, you know, this hasn't happened. This is like 30 years ago. So know? obviously buildings are hopefully better now. Is that what you're saying? Well, we used to have, we used to have a lot of vacant buildings. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, they've been renovated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... It's but like, you guys, when you guys sit around, and, and I, I imagine at times through the years, you you talk to other firefighters of of belief who go, that's yeah. not a coincidence that we just got out of that, right? I would have to say. I mean, I remember one time crawling. I was in this vacant building. It was like, it wasn't really vacant. It was like kind of like they had squatters, like hipsters type people living in this building. Like they took it over, you know, and they just did all these crazy alterations. And they put a hole in the floor, right, in the living room. Just in the middle of the living room, they just put a hole. And now we're at this fire. You know, it's rocking and rolling. And I'm crawling around, and I don't know why. I just stopped. I just, like, I just, like, just for some reason, I just stopped. And then I looked, and then there it is. There's a big hole, like, <laughs> a hole in the floor, you know. Like, this stuff just happens, used to happen all the time. And how far was the drop into the next room? No, it was just the next, the next yeah, floor down. Just, it's just a 10-foot, 11-foot, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, I mean, would you tell your wife this stuff when, when it happened? No. <laughs> no, not really. No. No, this so, was a long time ago. No, this I understand. Is, this I is just, like ancient history now. Yeah. Like but still, I mean, these these are the kinds of things you would you wouldn't tell your wife because, yeah, there were thirty of us and uh, we ran out and uh, just then the build five story building collapsed or whatever is like. I think we just took it for granted, you know. I remember this guy, um, you know, he kind of helped me straighten out my life a little bit. He was a good friend of mine. This guy Pete. We had gone to Medjugorje. We were going to go to Medjugorje together. I wound up going because he died in the fire. But um, you know, right before he died. He stayed at my house. He came up to where I live. And um, so he's in his back bedroom. And I remember getting up in the middle of the night. And I opened up. I, I, I guess his door was open. And I can't, I can't describe what I saw. It was like this light that I can't describe. It was, it was so white, it was almost like silver. Like It was like it just filled the whole room. Like it was just like he was... Like he was in there sleeping, bathed in this like crazy white light. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, he died like uh, soon after. In a, in a fire. Yeah. Yeah. What is what a sign for you though? I mean that that was almost like for you in a way. I mean it's for him, but it's for you to let you know that he's okay. Well, it's before he died though. I know, but the point being yeah. is that it's like an early yeah. sign that, that God's got yeah. him. I mean, he's, he's yeah. yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. How cool Just is so that? Many, you know what? I, I mean, if you think about your life, if you really, you know, <laughs> analyze things that happen, you, you, have to, you have to say that there's some kind of, someone's, someone's directing the, the show. It's not me. <laughs> yeah. You know? Oh, like this yeah. one time. Yeah, me too. A microphone fell on my foot. I could have been killed. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous job. <laughs> oh, don't get me started. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, it's horrible. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned that you went to Magigoria. Anything happened there? Yeah, you know, yeah. That was, that was kind of weird too, man. Um, 
Yeah, I saw this thing that I just can't even describe. I was walking with this woman. We were walking from, I don't know, from the hill or something. Where we were going, I look up, and there's this, like, gold orb. I don't know how to describe it. Because I thought it was a helicopter. I'm like, oh, that's kind of strange. Why is that helicopter? I know it wasn't a plane. I'm like, that's a, that's really strange. Like, there's a helicopter here at, like, 11 o'clock at night, whatever, you know? I didn't pay any mind to it. And about a minute later, I look up. And it's like, it just stopped. Like, just stopped. It, it, it didn't, it wasn't moving anymore. It was just like right over us. And, um, I don't know. <laughs> it was just, uh, I thought it was a helicopter. I just assumed it was a helicopter because what else could it be? But it was like this goldish, I don't know how to describe it. It was just like a big spherical, I don't know. It was bright. I, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I don't even know what it was. It was just it was just moving and then it just stopped. It was like what on is, top of us and then hmm. it just stopped. Was it uh, like a light? Was it more of a light than a? I guess yeah. I guess I could describe it if I had to put put a, 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 a like call it something. I'd have to say it was I guess it was a light. You know? But golden? You say golden? It was gold. That hmm. that I could tell you. I know it was gold. Just stopped. Like just stopped. Like dead stop. And you looked and up. It. And then what? Yeah. No, Which leaves dead. first, you leave or did it leave? I think I, I just, I don't, I don't know what it was. I was so confused. I just kept, all right, Medjugorje, you know, I just kept going. You know? <laughs> this is stuff. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, just another day in Medjugorje. Okay. It was, it was like the place is like, like charged, like full of electricity, yeah, you know? Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's very true. Yeah. I, I like Medjugorje. I did it, done that. You know, I got the t shirt, but I, I, I still like, I just, this September, we went to, my wife and I went to the Holy Land. We went to, took a Middle East trip, you know, and uh, I got to go to Mass inside the, uh, the Christ tomb. Nice. Church of the Resurrection? Yeah. Is that where you guys were? No, the ske- se- ske- Actually went inside the Holy Sepulchre? His tomb. His wow. tomb. Wow. Yeah, what happened was our guide, he's like, because it was a million people there. And he says, you know, he says, if you come back tomorrow morning at five o'clock in the morning, there'll be no one here. So I, I said, I'm I'm in. I got up at like four thirty. I was just happy to. I w- I would have just been happy to touch it. Like I just want to go, just touch it. Say I I just touched the tomb. You know, this this brother of priest, the Franciscan. I'm standing like right at the door, and I'm with this other guy, this guy Terry. And like the priest grabs me and he pushes me and he says, Are "You here for the mass?" I'm like, uh, "Yeah, I guess." <laughs> so I go in and. Uh, and my friend, he's not even Catholic. He's just like, he's just going along for the ride, you know. And I'm, I'm listening to the priest. He's an Irish priest. That, that's an experience. Describe yeah. how big that tomb is that you can have a mass inside there. It's like a little dome, right? So maybe seven people fit in the ante room, ante room, you know. And then there's like a, like a, 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 an entrance way that's only like five feet. You had to duck to go through it. And then there's just like this big table stone table i guess or you know and um services like the altar and only i think three or four people could fit in there so really in the whole place only like 10 people could fit mm-hmm. you know in the whole tomb the altar then was where where christ's body was laid out is that the uh yeah 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 i would say yeah wow yeah incredible are, are you familiar with the miracle of the holy fire you know i heard you talking about that greatest story never told i don't get it <laughs> it's, it's just the greatest sign of the yeah. resurrection you know you know, you mentioned how you've been a, you know, Christian soldier your whole life is, is just, uh, and I, I kind of get a sense that you, it's, it's just kind of part of your fabric. You know, you tell these stories and they help fortify all of our faiths. They help, they remind us about angels and divine intervention and God is with us and all those kinds of things. And I don't know, are, are you the kind of guy that sits down and talks faith with people or do you pretty much just let, let life take care of itself? You know, I'm not one of those preachy guys. Um, I try to say, uh, I try to like kind of try to walk the walk a little bit, but if it comes up, if it's appropriate, I, I'll, you know, I'll talk about it, but I don't, I don't know. I just don't go out of my way, like preaching it like, you know. Now, what are you doing? Now you're making, now it's not, now it's not candy in your mouth. What are you, what are you playing with now, Danny? Oh, the fire is crackling. I'm sitting here by the fireplace. Oh, you moved to the fireplace. Wow. Well, I have a fire pit outside, so I meditate out here with the fire. Oh, you're now you're outside. Okay, I got you. But I was blessed in a sense that I grew up in a very 
very um the church was the was the focal point of of the of the neighborhood it was a small picture new york city is a, a gigantic place yet it could be a small town because we were surrounded by some kind of borders that made us unique you know we were just kind of small and very very close and everybody knew each other and everything revolved around the church i was an altar boy i went to catholic school catholic high school catholic college I, I just remember being an altar boy and I'm just looking at that Eucharist and saying to myself, that's Christ. Like I read somewhere once, I don't know where I read it, but they said every time that host is elevated, there's a million angels just worshiping that, that one Eucharist, you know. And uh, I, w- I was just firmly, I would look at that Eucharist and believe like that is Jesus Christ in that, that bread right there, you know. So I think I sent you a, a link to that video of the Eucharistic miracles, you know. Oh, I love those. Yeah, I love it. So anyway, my priest uh, friend, we were talking. He says, did you hear the story about the Pope? He changed his plans. He was in some city, I forget, Philadelphia, whatever it was. And um, anyway, it upset the Secret Service now because they have to, um, you know, they have to change all their security plans and they have to vet everything, you know. So he wanted to stop in this church. And, you know, I don't think I'm telling secrets out of school. I, it's not publicized. But anyway, um they sent in these dogs, these uh, dogs that sniff out people, like people hiding out and whatnot. Oh, oh I see. But anyway, he said that um, when the dogs got to the tabernacle, um, they started going crazy. Like there was a human in there. You know. <laughs> Is that a true story? Is that a true story? <laughs> it's a true story, yeah. Ah, I, heard from the priest, yeah. I haven't heard oh. that. That's great. I'm not a, a thumper, but... I try to find the balance. I mean, you know, I mean, I just, and I think sometimes God presents opportunities. And when they're presented, I, I take advantage of them. I, I'm really listening. I'm, you know, I don't want to get too, I'm taking it like just a little at a time. I'm learning a lot, actually, just living, listening to you, some of your podcasts. They're very educational. You do your homework, I have to tell you. These kinds of stories are what awaken me to, Understand that it was, and it's not the awakening that's the relationship, it's the awakening that leads to the relationship. So as people hear these stories, the idea being is either fortifies you, awakens you, or it's just part of the encounter process to make it real. It just needs to be real. And just, uh, you're just, you're living it. You know, you really are. You're, you're living it. Just quietly going about your business and not so quietly uh, saving lives and uh, and having angels right. save your life. And, and Oh, please. You know, <laughs> He's been very busy. He's he's going to be exhausted by the time I I finish this ride. He's he's going to be like, he, I want battle pay or man, I, we've been on some ride together. That's for sure. Thanks, Danny. Told you he's got stories. He's can he's got more stories. He'll be back. Oh, I looked it up. Nineteen ninety five, Pope John Paul II. He was in Baltimore, making all the rounds, making all these stops. He was going to a seminary, and there was a, a and he was just supposed to shake hands outside or something. He decided he wanted to go in the chapel. Well, they had to bring out the dogs. The, uh, these dogs that can uh, sniff out people, you know, and I guess they went into the seminary and they had to go running around all the different rooms and buildings and down aisles and everything. And there, you know, everything was fine. And then they went, and then they made their way to the, the small chapel, the small side chapel where the, the Pope ultimately was going to pray. And <laughs> they went up to the tabernacle and that's when they started signaling they had found someone. So somebody was in there, you know, so, uh, and they wouldn't leave. They wouldn't leave until the handlers, you know, called them off. So. True story. It was a true story. Uh, and as far as these uh, angel stories, great stories, wonderful stories. I mean, really, finding the baby the way he did, the firefighter who fell 30 feet onto a, a bed. <laughs> I mean, they just go on and on and on. And of course, this is all scriptural as well. I mean, we look into the Bible and over 250 mentions of, of angels doing things in the Bible, you know. And you have Matthew 18, where Jesus, you know, holding one of the children saying, um, you know, talking about the the angels in heaven, the children's angels in heaven. And we're, and we're all children with our angels. We, we never lose our guardian angels. As they say yes to the Lord and work with us to, do, uh, to be servants, to be fellow servants. Very cool stories. Speaking of saying yes to the Lord, uh, watch this segue. I am a trained professional. Uh, when it comes to saying yes, the big yes that uh, started this Christianity thing, that would be Mary and that big yes to the angel Gabriel. See, angel. It's always, uh, angels are always in there. Uh, the CD, Mary, His Messenger, is available here at episode 110, touchbyheaven.net or at trapperjackspeaks.com. In fact, I was, I, I was giving a Mary talk 
And a gentleman in the audience said, is there a one episode that has all this merry stuff? And I go, no, they're scattered all over the place. So good idea. Maybe we put these things all in one place. In fact, there's no one talk I've ever given about Mary where all these stories are there. So um, check it out at either here, episode 110, touchbyheaven.net or at trapperjackspeaks.com. Mary, his messenger. All right. Uh, uh, oh, I need your story. Uh, you're still sitting on it. Nothing to be afraid of. Not before, oh, before, if, if you haven't fallen asleep yet, if you're listening to this, nothing to be afraid of. Contact me at touchbyheaven. Oh, you're, are you snoring? Is that you I hear snoring? Eh. Anyway, come here to touchbyheaven.net. Believe me, your story. Okay? Okay. I'll see you next week uh, here at Touch by Heaven. Everyday Encounters with God. Thanks for listening. I'm Trapper Jack. Thank you.